Sport bike engines are basically little race car engines. They have all the performance modifications already done, so you get a lot of horsepower per dollar per cubic centimeter or whatever. The point is that you're not going to do much better than BMW did, so if you're on a budget, just get all the original parts and call it good. Except that sport bike intakes are gigantic. They are about the size of the whole engine. I don't have room for this in my tiny little car, and I had the same problem when I shoved a motorcycle engine into my Honda S600. I designed a small, short intake, and it still didn't fit. So I'm going to do the same thing here again, but this time with a little more concern for maximizing horsepower since this is a race car. We'll make sure to make this thing structurally sound so a failure of the manifold does not cause my floor pan to fall out, which would be bad since I sit on the floor pan. We'll also try to keep cost down since I'm not made of money, and we're going to try to keep effort reasonably low since I am made of lazy. There are three main design considerations for this intake, the size and shape of it, the length of the runners, and the location of the fuel injectors. BMW probably did a lot of work on this, so we're going to keep an eye on what they did with their intake. We'll also look at why intakes are designed the way they are. We'll do some math and engineering, and then we'll ignore all the math and just kind of wing it. Everything is a spring, some things more than others. Air is definitely a spring, especially in your intake. When your engine is sucking in air, that air has momentum. When the intake valve closes, it still has that momentum, and that causes the air to squish up against the back of the valve like a spring. When that spring releases, it bounces back up toward the intake. This is just a pressure wave, and when it gets to the end of the intake runner, it hits a pillow of air in the intake, which bounces it back toward the valve. At a certain RPM, that pressure wave will hit the back of the valve while it's open, giving you an extra little boost of air, sort of like a mini supercharger. This wave can bounce back and forth multiple times, so you can catch it on the second or third bounce, it just loses a bit of energy each time. So you can tune your intake runner lengths to give you little peaks of power at different RPMs. This is why you see engines with variable intake runner lengths. If you can change the length while the engine is sweeping through its RPM range, you can get this benefit at a lot of different RPMs. I really only care about peak power. This means I need to tune these lengths for about 13,000 RPMs. But how do you tune the lengths? Math. There are a couple of theories for this, several actually, but the two we're looking at here are the Helmholtz resonator theory and the induction wave ram cylinder charging theory. You just plug your numbers into these equations and they will tell you how long your runner needs to be for your target RPM. Except the numbers you get from these two equations are different, except at this one RPM. Also, Helmholtz is sometimes criticized for not being applicable above a few thousand RPMs, so let's forget about this garbage and look at some testing. These are results from dyno testing I found online. This is from the RIT Formula Racing Team a few years ago. This shows torque versus RPM for five different intake runner lengths. You can clearly see that the changing runner length changes the peak torque, so this does have a noticeable effect. You might also notice that there are other peaks, three sets. There are five down here, five in the middle, and you can start to see the third peak for each runner length before the graph gets cut off. Just look at this red runner line. This is an 11 inch runner. It has peaks at 5300, 8000, and 11,000 RPMs. This doesn't line up with any of the theoretical links from the math, which further supports my theory that math is dumb. All of these resonant frequencies and bouncing waves depend heavily on the geometry of the intake, the runners, the plenum volume and shape, the other waves from the other cylinders. These equations are way too simplified for this. If we look at this chart, I should need an intake runner length a little over 4 inches. If we extrapolate this data from the RIT paper, I need a runner length of about 3.5 inches. Both of these are too short. For one, the runner length inside the cylinder head is longer than 4 inches. Also, I don't want the volume of the intake runner length to be less than the volume of the cylinder. This thing needs to breathe easily, I need air volume inside. The right thing to do here would be to build a full computer model and actually run simulations with all the geometry, then we could use that data to build physical tests to correlate that simulation data to, then we would know for sure. But I'm not going to do that, because that sounds like it would take a lot of time. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to search around for a bunch of intake runner length calculators online and see what they say. Then we're going to go back to that physical testing and extrapolate from there. Using the spacing of these peaks and aiming for the third peak around 13,000 RPM, adjusting for a different runner diameter, we get a length of about 7 inches. All of those online calculators, most of them are around 7 inches, so uh, yeah, let's go with 7 inches. This is pretty close to what BMW uses on their bike. Their intake has dual runner lengths, but the shortest it gets is a little under 8 inches. They're aiming for a wider RPM range, and I'm aiming for peak, so I'll go a little bit shorter and move it up in the RPMs. So yeah, theirs is a little bit longer. Mine's a bit shorter, but you know what they say. It's not the length of your intake runners that matter. It's the length of your dick. <laughs>
Most modern sport bikes use two stages of injectors. They have a lower injector that usually sits below the throttle plates, relatively close to the intake valves. This is great for low RPMs because you get good atomization of the fuel and it gets sprayed pretty much right into the cylinder. But at higher RPMs, this fuel doesn't have enough time to atomize and the injectors are usually open for longer than the intake valve. So at around 7,000 RPMs, you transition up to these injectors here. Your low RPM drivability and fuel efficiency comes from these and your peak horsepower comes from these. I only care about peak horsepower, so I'm gonna go with the upper injectors only. I got some Bosch injectors from DIY Autotune. I also got the Megasquirt MS3 Pro from them. This will be powering the injectors, but that comes later. I got injectors that are a little bit bigger than I need. With smaller injectors, they will be spraying fuel almost constantly, and that might cause an adjacent cylinder to pull fuel from the wrong injector. This could cause the inside cylinders to run a little more rich than the outside ones. BMW has their upper injectors inside these upper trumpets, so they shouldn't have to worry about this, but I don't have partitions between my injectors, so this might be a concern. With a little more fuel flow, I can have the injector open mostly only when the appropriate intake valve is open. This will negatively affect idle, but I don't care about that. The BMW intake has the upper injectors pretty far away. I can't do that because I have to fit this all inside a streamlined body. If I move the injectors up here, I'd have to have the body go around them and that would increase the frontal area and would cause more drag. I might get a little more power from this, but not enough to make up for the added drag. So I moved the injectors down a little bit and angled them back a little bit. This is sort of splitting the difference between the upper and lower injectors. It's not ideal and it doesn't spray right at the valves, but I'm hoping at 13,000 RPMs, there's enough chaos in here to fully atomize the fuel before it gets to the cylinders. So I have the intake runners and the fuel injectors. Now I need an air box. I'm gonna pull air from the front of the vehicle. So I'll have this volume sweep forward. The idea is to eventually run this engine on two cylinders for the smaller 500cc engine class, but I'm gonna go ahead and make an intake for all four cylinders. This way it's easier to run in the one liter class later. It's basically the same amount of effort to make a four cylinder intake as it is to make a two cylinder intake. So I have a triangle going forward with the throttle body on the front of it. This has a vague curve shape on the top to direct the air into the runners. I also have a shelf back here for the injectors to attach to. The top corners are angled like this to clear the body. I might have to do a slight bump here to clear the fuel rail, but I should be able to blend it in so that it doesn't affect aerodynamic drag. The intake is all faceted, so I can make this using my favorite manufacturing process, welded laser cut parts. If I were going to make this intake again, I'd probably raise the height up here to get more volume, and I'd probably also make it a little bit bigger on the back and sides but I started fabricating the intake before I decided that, so it is what it is. Speaking of fabricating, Originally, I had considered just using the BMW throttle bodies, but there are a couple of problems with that. They have these lower injectors that I'm not using, and there's not really a great way to attach the intake to the top of it. I also want this intake to be able to take a turbocharger in case I want to do that at some point, and it's not going to be great with all these holes and passageways, so I made my own runners. I bought some aluminum tube and cut it to length. I duplicated the taper that BMW has in their throttle bodies. I assume it's there for a reason, so I just copied it. I chucked these up in a lathe and set the angle to 3.8 degrees or thereabouts and lathed in the taper. That's right, I lathed it. I lathed it on the lathe. I'm a lather. At the bottom, the runners attached to the engine with these rubber boots, so I duplicated the bottom of the stock throttle bodies. These turned out great, which is awesome because they were actually super easy to make. Win-win. There are also radius inlets at the top of the runners. I'm going to call these trumpets. You can buy trumpets to weld in, but they're never exactly the right shape. I could 3D print these and install them inside the aluminum intake, and I did that on the S600. But I own a CNC router that can cut aluminum, so I just made my own. Typically, you'd have these higher in the manifold with air all around them, but I don't really have the space for this. It's also way easier to build it this way. I just bought some aluminum and CNC cut these trumpets in as part of the bottom plate of the intake. My router will do aluminum, but you have to do really shallow cuts with a single flute end mill. This was a 13 hour job. Although that was partly because I didn't want to finish it, so I did a really tight finishing pass with a ball end mill. Thankfully, I have my baby monitor camera that I can just periodically glance at to see when I broke an end mill. On the bottom, I cut out a little recess for each runner to nestle into so they are located accurately. I also CNC cut out the injector bungs. This is just a narrow piece of aluminum machined with little pockets for the bottom of the injectors. These four holes are the injector bung holes. <laughs> These three holes are for some threaded rod that I'm going to add in to clamp it all together. I'll have left hand threads on the bottom and right hand threads on the top and an adapter in the middle to squish it all together. That way the injector will be squished between the fuel rail and the bung hole. 
<laughs> the fuel rail is just some extruded aluminum fuel rail. You can get this in various sizes. I tapped these three holes here for those threaded rods. These four holes are drilled for fuel flow. I'll mill pockets in these holes for the other side of the fuel injector. We'll call this the rear bung hole. I started to machine this on my garbage hobby mill using an end mill with too many flutes chucked up since I don't have a call at this size, but after about three seconds I decided this was all around a bad idea, even for me. So I swung by a friend's shop and used his mill. Much better. You can also buy individual machined bungs that you can weld in yourself if you don't want to go the machining route. DIY Autotune sells these for these injectors. I welded the runners to my trumpets, but I had some trouble doing this. At first, I thought the plate was some odd alloy, but they're both 6061, so it should be weldable. This is not the worst aluminum welding I've ever done, but it's close. I got these most of the way done and decided to call it good. I'll smear some silicone sealant around the edge to make sure it's airtight. This is more than enough weld to hold these together, and I'm afraid if I keep going, I'm going to blow through the sidewall on the runner since it gets pretty thin out there. If I get some gray three bond and smear it around the sides, nobody will ever notice. And if they do, that's fine too, because it will at least look better than this garbage. Once they were welded together, I filed down the edges between the machined part and the runners, then I went back and sanded it down with a couple different pieces of sandpaper. They were pretty close to begin with, but my angle on the lathe was off a tiny bit. I want these to be smooth so I don't have any disruptions in the airflow. The rest of the intake is laser cut and bent aluminum made by... Anyone? Anyone? Send, cut, send. I went with an eighth inch or about three millimeters, which is pretty thick, but like I said, I do want to be able to turbocharge this in the future. I didn't add tabs to these laser cut parts like I usually do. I guess I was just being lazy. That seems to be a theme with this project. This did, unfortunately, result in things not exactly lining up, so I had to do some bending and some squishing to get everything in line. The geometry on this is not critical, at least not for most parts, but the inlet near the throttle body should probably be somewhat accurate. I also had sharp corners that did not want to weld. I'd get close to the corner and a piece would just melt off and fall in. This was slightly frustrating, but about that time I ran out of both argon and aluminum filler, so I took a break to get some supplies. Before it was all together, I added the left-hand threaded bolts to the bung rail. I used red Loctite on this since I don't want it to come loose, but then I welded the rest of the intake, and the way that you get Loctite off is to heat it up, so I'll have to go back and re-Loctite this. The throttle body flange warped a little bit, so I'll need to figure out a way to flatten that out. I still need to add features to hold the throttle cables, and I should probably put some straps on the side to hold the intake down to the engine so a backfire doesn't blow this thing off of the engine. Anyway, that's an intake. We looked at the math. We ignored the math. We extrapolated from someone else's testing of a different engine. We looked at a bunch of online calculators, and we made a wild guess. And that, my friends, is engineering. Not actually engineering. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. <laughs>